Welcome to Christ Supreme Ministry, the House of Restoration. We invite you to worship with us and receive the Spirit-filled message as we hear from the Lord. God bless you as you listen, in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the living Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Good evening, everybody. You're welcome to another Tuesday Bible study. Please let us invite our family and friends. Let us share the link. Let us even give it a like, a thumbs up. Let us share the link as part of our, our own evangelism to our families and our friends. Hallelujah. You are welcome once again to the presence of the Lord. Please let us rise up as we begin. Let's just begin by thanking God for this moment. Let us thank him for another opportunity for us to be gathered online for another Tuesday Bible study. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, even for preserving us from the beginning of this week. We are grateful, Lord Jesus, to be here as a church, to be here as a family, to be here as individuals. Lord, we give you all the glory, all the honor, all the adoration, Lord. Receive it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us commit ourselves into the hands of the Lord, that even as we are here, let us pray that this will be a lovely time in the presence of the Lord, that as the word will come, that the, Lord, the Holy Spirit will minister through the speaker of today, that as they speak, as they stand here to teach us, that we will be blessed as the hearers, and even as they are teaching us, they themselves will be blessed in Jesus' name. Let us begin to commit this service into the hands of the Lord. Lord Jesus, we come unto you. We commit this entire service, this entire Bible study, into your hands from this moment forth, Lord. Come and take your place, have your way. Even as we are here as the hearers, no matter where we're listening from, as we are here as the hearers of tonight's word, help us, Lord Jesus, to be blessed that what we learn today, we will not just hear it and forget about it, but we will truly think about it and it will impact our lives posit positively in Jesus' name. And even as the speaker of today will come and speak and teach us, Holy Spirit, teach through them in the name of Jesus. Let the words of their mouths not just fall to the ground, but let them bless us in the name of Jesus. Even as they are here, let them themselves be blessed by their teaching. In the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this midst in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us begin to ask for mercy if there's anything that we have done wrong, anything that we have done wrong from the beginning of this week, from the beginning of this day, that will not allow the word of today to impact us positively or to bless us. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit will have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Jesus, we commit ourselves into your hands and we ask for your mercy. Lord Jesus, we are not perfect beings, but Lord, we run unto you for mercy. We run unto you, Lord Jesus, that you will cleanse us. If there is anything that we have done wrong in the secret, in the public, in our speech, in our thoughts towards ourselves or even towards others, Holy Spirit, have mercy on us in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord Jesus, that nothing will stand against your word from blessing us, from enriching our lives in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us co cover ourselves in the blood of Jesus, wherever you are listening from, wherever you are tuning in from. Just begin to plead the blood of Jesus over your surroundings, over the church, over anybody, everybody that is listening, and even those who will listen in the future. Let's just call on the blood of Jesus to shield us in the name of Jesus. Lord, we call upon your blood. We ask the Lord, your blood will shield us wherever we are watching from, far and near, be it daytime or nighttime, even those who may be at work, those on the road, those just in their houses. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. We plead the blood of Jesus over ourselves that are here. We pray, Lord Jesus, that your peace will reign upon us in the name of Jesus. And even as we worship you this, uh, this evening, as we praise you and as we worship you, Holy Spirit, come and take your place in the name of Jesus. And that all glory be unto your holy name in the name of Jesus. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Elohim and Adonai, age to age you're still the same, by the power of your name, El Shaddai, El Shaddai. Say by the power. 
Lord this evening. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord, the Lord has made.
once again to our Tuesday night Bible study. Thank you all for being in attendance, everyone online, worldwide. I pray as you gather together today that all that we are going to be learning today shall profit us and that it shall help us in our 
growth and how we journey in this life in Jesus' mighty name. Let us call our all our neighbors, all our friends. Let us get on, uh, come online. And I pray that as you do that, the Lord will bless you richly in Jesus' mighty name. Let us pray. Father, we bless you, Lord. We exalt you. Eternal rock of ages, we give you praise. We thank you, Lord, for this day that you have made for which I rejoice. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to sit at your feet to receive your word. We ask, Lord, that as your word is coming forth, O Lord, that it will fall upon our hearts. Our hearts are ready to receive. We pray that our hearts, the texture of our hearts is fine is ready to receive the word of God and as the, our hearts are receiving the word of God the word of God is germinating bringing forth fruit in our lives and we are becoming hundredfold Christians in the mighty name of Jesus thank you Lord Father for what you're doing I ask you Lord that even myself as, as the one that you have chosen to do this work at this hour I ask Lord that I myself shall not be disqualified I ask Lord that you that you will anoint my mouth that my mouth will not speak anything else but that which you want your, 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 your people to know O Lord Thank you, Lord, for our God, for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. I welcome us once again to our Tuesday night Bible study. Tonight, we are going to be looking at the topic called understanding the nature of heavenly inheritance. Understanding the nature of heavenly inheritance. We're going to open our Bibles Let's open our Bibles to 1 Peter 1, 1 to 12. I'm reading from the NKJV version. 1 Peter 1, 1 to 12. I read. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispensation in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Pedania, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, and undefiled, and, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the, genuine, that the genuineness of your faith being much precious than gold that, that, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be, found to, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy, inexpressible, full, and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that will come to you. Searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, who was in them, was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that will follow. Verse 12. To them it was revealed that not it, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which not have which not which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desired to look into. We bless the reading of the word of the Lord in Jesus' name. We are looking at understanding the heavenly in, the nature of the heavenly inter, in, in, inheritance. And in the scripture that we read. Uh, Apostle, Apostle Peter is writing to strangers. He's writing to strangers, strangers in the sense that they are visitors in the countries that they are dispersed to. In verse 1, Peter uses the phrase, the dispersion, according to, according to the NKJV version. However, an interpretation of this phrase in the King James, in the King James version is the word scatter. This tells us that Peter was addressing saints that were scattered 
to different parts of the world. Another way to look at this is that they were spread to certain places. Peter identifies saints, identified the saints in his writing as pilgrims. He identified them as pilgrims, which is to say that they, they did not belong to the places they spread to or came from, but they belonged to a heavenly place, a heavenly world. In verse 2, Peter classifies, qualifies, and describes these saints as elect. Verse 2 says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, of God the Father in, spring, in sanctification of the Spirit. He identifies them as the elect. The word in Greek means the called out ones. This word is a term used for Christians who have chosen to, who are being chosen by God for salvation. Romans 8 verse 33 says, Whom shall, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. The word elect in this scripture means God's chosen ones. This means that God has chosen us even before we answer the call for salvation, which means that before the beginning of the, before the beginning of time, God had already made up His mind. He had already elected. He had already chosen us, right? However, even though He had already chosen us, we were still required to answer His call for salvation. Amen. We were answered to answer the we were we were we were required to answer the call for salvation. Now this is the, these are the, these are the seals that are that identify us when we call, when we answer the call. When we answer the call, the seed that identifies us is, is the elect. Amen? Verse two, verse 2 goes on to say, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, which means that, which means that he of his own, of his own eternal purposes, he had spoken a predetermined re relationship in the knowledge of God in the eternity past. Like I've just said before, this means that God made provision for us to come to him, but it is our decision as free moral agents to answer the call to come to him. Our election is maintained by the sanctification of the spirit, which is, which is simply the cleansing, of the, the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit, which means that the Holy Spirit working in us and making us holy and setting us apart from sin unto righteousness. This means we are separated from our old ways unto God to be more like him. Second Thessalonians 2, Second, Second Thessalonians 2, 13 to 14, it says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation, true sanctification, by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we were all called even though our election was predetermined. We are elected for a reason. We are elected for a reason. And the reason we are elected is so that we can obey. We can obey him. True salvation produces obedience to Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 10, Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. By aligning with God's agenda and purposes for our lives, we stand in obedience, which means that we are in agreement and not, we are not selective with the ways of life taught in his word. Amen? The other reason for our election is the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. The sprinkling seals the covenant God has promised and is activated when we give our lives to Jesus Christ. The covenant is active because we have, we have drawn ourselves to him. Hebrews 10 verse 22, Hebrews 10 verse 22 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from all evil conscience 
and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 3 makes us understand the how, it makes us understand how we were offered salvation. How we were offered salvation. We were offered salvation because of his abundant mercy. We were offered salvation because of his abundant mercy. Titus 3 verse 5. Titus 3 verse 5. Titus 3 verse 5 says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. There's a song that says, Not by the works we have done, but by the grace of the Lord. Not by the works we have done, O Lord, but by the grace of the Lord. It is by his grace that we that we are that he that we are drawn to him, amen. So, you know, Titus three verse five says, "Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit." Verse three says that according to his abundant mercy, he 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 has begotten us again. According to his abundant mercy, he has begotten us again, which means. Which means part of the provision of salvation is a new birth. Let's read verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, who according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. John 1. John, now this means when a sinner comes to Christ and puts his faith in him, he is born anew into God's family. John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. He says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Verse 30 says, Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So when we, you know, he, but through his abundant mercy, not of works of righteousness, but through his abundant mercy, we have been, he made the provision of salvation, of, of, which is new birth, that which means that when we as sinners came to him, right, when we had the gospel, when we came to him in faith, he, we received the new birth. Amen. Verse 3 tells us that we are begotten again to a living hope. We are begotten again to a living hope. What does this mean? It means that you are a child of God. You, as a child of God, you have eternal life. You, as a child of God, you have eternal life. You are, beg you are begotten to a, new, to a living hope. This living hope is eternal life, and it, is, it, is, it, is, it, is, it has certain characteristics. One of the characteristics, uh, a few of the characteristics of this living, uh, this living hope is that it's hope that comes from God. It is hope that comes from God. Psalm 43, verse 5. Psalm 43, 43, verse 5. It says, why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted in within me? This is David speaking to himself here. And he says, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. The help of my countenance and my God. This is the characteristic of our hope. Our hope is able to lift us up when we, when we are even down. Another characteristic of hope is that it's a gift of grace. It is a gift of grace. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17. 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 to 17 says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort our hearts and establish you in every good works word and works. The key word here is good hope by grace. It is a gift of grace. Amen. Another characteristic of living hope is that it's defined by the scriptures. It is defined by the scriptures. Romans 15 verse 4. Romans 15 verse 4. It says, for whatever things were written before were written for our hearing, for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So it is defined for us in the scriptures that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Another characteristic of living this living hope is that it is secured. It is secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is secured by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. John 11, 25 to 26. 
John 11, 25 to 26, says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Verse 26, and whoever lives, whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? So this is Jesus Christ speaking here, and he's telling us that he is eternal life. He is the living hope. Amen? He whoever believes in him has life. Amen? Verse 4, which is our emphasis this evening, verse 4, which is our emphasis, I will read it again from verse 3, from verse 3, uh, 1 Peter 1, from verse 3 to 4. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Verse 4, being our emphasis on the nature of heavenly inheritance, it is, is, is something that we want to look at. That all that we have been listening to so far are the qualifications of a Christian who is saved and qualifies for the heavenly inheritance. Now, knowing the nature of heavenly inheritance helps you and I to endure. Amen? When you know the nature of of heavenly inheritance, it helps you so to, to, it helps you to, so that you will stand, so that you will be immovable. Amen? The Bible says that those that endure shall be saved. So when you understand, when you understand the nature of our, of our heavenly inheritance, when you understand the nature of the heavenly inheritance, it helps you to endure. It helps you so that you will be saved. This means that we must be able we must, sorry, we must be willing to pay the price of endurance to receive the heavenly inheritance, which is more precious than anything else you can think of. The nature of something is the character of the thing and is used to describe it. So we want to look at the, the we want to look at, in verse 4, you can see how it is being, it is being uh, it's described and defined to us. Having a divine consciousness of the heavenly inheritance motivates you and I to do more for the kingdom of God. We are motivated, we are motivated not by ambition, but by heavenly inheritance to leave our mark on the earth because our mind is occupied with heaven. We align with the word of God to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness before anything else. It is what, us, it is what makes us effective as Christians. As I was studying for this, there's, a, there's a, uh, a saying I discovered, and it says that aim at heaven, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, and you will get, you will, and you will get neither. So we, we, are, we are supposed to aim for heaven, so that when we aim for heaven, right, God now throws in the earth, because we are aiming for something higher. We are aiming for something, something loftier. Right? But if we do the reverse and all we are chasing is the earth and we are not chasing heaven, guess what? You will neither get earth or get heaven. Why do I say this? I say this because those who seek earthly things are never satisfied. You will keep chasing and chasing and chasing, but you internally you will, such people will still be empty. I pray that we shall not be empty in Jesus' mighty name. According to verse 4, the characteristics of the nature of heavenly inheritance is that heavenly inheritance is one, incorruptible, two, undefiled, three, does not defade away and is reserved in heaven for you. You can see that in 1 Peter 1 verse 4. Now the heavenly inheritance is the divine we are going to experience in, tot in, in totality one day. But while we are here on earth, but while we are here on earth, God has chosen, He has chosen us, God wants us rather, to be conscious of the fact that we are supposed to start experiencing our inheritance now. What does this mean? It means that right now, when you when you when you when 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 you and I are caught up, when we leave this earth, right, that is when we are going to experience it in totality. We are going to experience the heavenly inheritance inheritance in totality but right now as a child of god you are supposed to be experiencing that inheritance now you're supposed to be experiencing a, the measure of that inheritance now how do we know this how do we know this we know this based on the definitions of the characteristics of the heavenly inheritance 
the Bible says in first, it says in First Peter one verse four, it says that the heavenly inheritance is incorruptible. What does this mean? When it says it's incorruptible, it means that it is. It means it's everlasting. Our heavenly inheritance is everlasting, which means never to end. Never to end. It's also described as undefiled, which means never to be spoiled and does not fade away, which means never to lose a special attraction. Amen? When you are walking in divine inheritance, when you are walking in heavenly inheritance, we will see it all over you. Amen? We, you, 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 will be, you, you will be testifying of the goodness of God. Anytime we testify of the goodness of God, it is because we are tapping into our heavenly inheritance. Amen? That does not fade away. Every definition that I have just described to you or I've just speak, spoke out here carries the word never. Never. Which connotes, which means constant. When, you, when, somebody says, when, somebody, when somebody says that this thing can never die, it means that it's constant. It will always remain. Amen? It will always remain. Which means that it does not change. And this is what is used to describe our Lord Jesus Christ in Hebrews 13 verse 8. Hebrews 13 verse 8. It says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Our Lord Jesus does not change. He is the same yesterday, he is the same today, and he is the same forevermore. The heavenly inheritance is accessible to you today and forevermore. And will be experienced in totality, like I said, in heaven. Somebody is probably asking, how do I enjoy this inheritance? How do I enjoy this inheritance? It is very simple. The Bible says, only believe. That's the, that's the recipe. The recipe, the recipe to enjoy the inheritance is only believe. Mark 5, verse 36. Mark 5, verse 36 says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Mark 9, verse 20, 23. Mark 9, verse 23 also said that Jesus said to him, if, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, possible may not mean right now. But it means it will happen. Amen? It may, it may not mean, I mean that solution you are looking for. That answer may not happen right now. But possible means it will happen. When you do not know, but it will happen. And I pray that if there's an answer you are looking for, that happened, that answer, as you believe that the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, it is happening in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. All we have to do is seek first and keep believing. Seek first and keep believing. There's a man of God that said something in the program I just watched recently. He said that, you know, he said it's important that you do not put yourself under pressure. What's very most important is that you put is that you create intimacy with God in create team intimacy keep your eyes focused on God and not the pressure and not the problem keep your eyes focused on Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior finisher of our faith believing is not what I can see but believing is something as though they were. Which means, I don't need to see it. I just need to believe it as though they were. Which means, I am speaking it forth as though they were. Amen? Possible means that it may not happen now, but it will happen. Your job and my job is to keep believing. Is to keep believing that it will happen. Is to keep believing that it already exists in the it already exists in the eternal, and it's your job and my job to pull it down. We have the responsibility of pulling down our inheritance to the now. It, when you are pulling it down, when you are pulling it down, it might not mean today, it might not mean tomorrow, but it will come down. Why should we believe like this? The Bible tells me that it is reserved in heaven 
for you and I. It, it is reserved in heaven, what? For you and I. Colossians 1 verse 5. Colossians 1 verse 5. It tells me, it tells you and I, it tells me, you and I, that hope is laid for you and I in heaven. Can you imagine? It is laid up there. It is there for you. The eternal hope, that living hope, is waiting, it's laid up for us. Amen? It is our job as Christians, as Bible-believing Christians, to pull it down. Amen? Job 14 verse 7. Job 14 verse 7 and 9. It says, for there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, that it may sprout again, and that its tender shoots will not cease. Verse 9 says, yet at the scent of water. Verse 9, at the scent of water, it would bud and bring forth branches like a plant. Tell your neighbor, if you are a child of God, that I have hope. Amen. Things may be looking dark. Things may be looking bleak. It is your job and my job not to focus on the situation, not to focus on the problem, but to keep our eyes on the living hope, our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5 uses the phrase, who are kept, who are kept. He say, verse 5 says, First uh, Peter 1 verse 5 says, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Amen? Ready to be revealed at the last time. Verse 5 uses the phrase, who are kept, which is to say that the heavenly inheritance is kept and is also, and also we. Now, the heavenly inheritance is kept and also we are being kept secure in as long as we remain steadfast and do not backslide. In as long as we are not willing to doubt. In as long as we are willing to say, no, <clears throat> No matter what, I will keep my eyes on Jesus Christ. We are being kept secure. We and the heavenly inheritance are kept secure by the power of God through faith. Which means you are kept secure because you still believe. You have faith. You have faith because you have faith because that you are secure in Christ. Yet things may not look things may not look all right. Things may not look okay. Yet. You believe in Christ. The economy might be hard, yet you will keep you will keep your eyes on Christ. The things may be looking hard, yet you will keep your eyes what on Christ. We we and the heavenly inheritance are kept by the power of God through faith. As long as we keep believing and endure, you must endure. You are kept for salvation to be revealed at the last time. Nobody said that being a Christian is going to be easy. Nobody said that being a Christian, that they will not push you, they will not persecute you. But I, what I'm trying to tell you is that even though when, you know, there's all sorts of kinds of persecution, you people will, you know, like for example now, if you have friends who are married and you are not yet married, they, people will tell you, they will start putting pressure on you. When are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? Your kids are getting married. If you don't have a child, they will say, ah, your kids are, you already have many, so many kids. What are you waiting for? Do not let them push you into what is not yours. Wait on the Lord. His own timing is the best timing. Amen. I've seen people, I've seen, I've seen people whom God has given double for their trouble. Only because they chose to when people were pushing them, when people were telling them, go and see this Baba, go and do it. They said no. They will wait on the on the day of the Lord. And I pray that as you wait and endure, the Lord will answer you speedily in the mighty name of Jesus. 1 John 3 verse 2, 1 John 3 verse 2, he says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Amen? <laughs> we, we, see, we don't, we, we don't what, what, we are, what we really are has not yet been revealed. Who we really are has not yet been revealed. But it's our job, it's our responsibility as Christians to endure, to endure to the end, to be saved to the end. Amen? So we can really see, we can see, we can see him as he is. But for now, it is our responsibility to just believe. Verse 6 teaches us, verse 6 teaches us of the disposition we must have concerning the inheritance. The disposition we must have. Verse 6 says, in this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. 
Verse 6 tells us that we must have great joy. The disposition that you need to have concerning the heavenly interference, uh, sorry, inheritance is great joy. Because our inheritance is reserved. We must believe that it's waiting for us. It is there. And guess what? We, are, we have joy. We have joy everlasting no matter what. It, our, our inheritance is kept safe. And it's an assurance that, and when we have great joy, it is an assurance of our proven faith. When people see you that ah, even though this thing hasn't happened yet, but yet you are still, you know, you are joyful. You are still carrying about like as if the thing is already in your hand. Amen? It confuses the enemy. All right? Matthew 5, verse 12, he says, he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It is your job and my job that no matter what we are facing, no matter what we are going through, we must rejoice. We must rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is the reward. Great is our inheritance in heaven. Amen? Someone might be asking me, why should I rejoice if I am facing troubles, trials, and circumstances? Well, first of all, the Bible says in Psalm 34, verse 19, Psalm 34, verse 19, it says, many, it did say some, many are the afflictions of the righteous. But it says what? The Lord delivers them all. Uh, delivers him out of them all. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. The Lord knows that. But he knows that he will deliver you and I out of them all. You, you see, your rejoicing confuses the enemy. Apostle, Paul, Apostle Peter teaches us some principles about various trials in verse 6. What taking note of? If you are going through various trials, this, there's, some, there's, there's some principles about various trials that are worth, that are worth, noting, taking, that are worth noting, taking noting note of. He says in verse 6, you know, in verse 6, he uses the phrase, the phrase, little while. Let me read verse 6 again. He says, in this you greatly rejoice, though for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Now the phrase, the phrase little while means troubles do not, don't, do, does not last. Strong Christians do. The enemy can only trouble you for so long. When the enemy keeps troubling you, troubling you, at some point you do not budge. Guess what? He has to let go. He knows that you are not willing to give in to his deception. Amen? So, troubles don't last. In verse 6, he uses the, the phrase, if need be. Which means, troubles serve a purpose. They serve a purpose. They serve a purpose. Verse 6 uses the word grieved, meaning troubles bring distress. Now, you may, not, you may not understand this, but troubles actually serve a purpose. They serve a purpose. They, they are meant to, 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 to they, yes, they bring distress. But you, if you, the, the, the purpose of that distress, which is what I want you to understand, is this. Distress is a sign for a Christian that it is time to grow. Amen? Now, Anytime you are going through a test, that test is there. That trouble is there because it is, heaven is telling you to grow. Amen? See, when a, when a tree, when a tree is facing, now, it, now we, we know that a, a tree can grow, you know, if, if the grass is fertile, I mean, the, I mean, the ground is fertile, a tree can grow, you know, as high as whatever and bring forth fruit. But sometimes a tree can be stagnant. Amen. A tree can be stagnant. And when a tree is, is facing stagnation, the, is one of the tricks that the farmers do is that the farmer smacks it at the stem. He can smack it with the, with the shovel at the stem. And when it smacks it, the tree at the stem, the, 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 tree, the tree now experience is in distress. When it's in distress, guess what? That distress is signal to the tree to grow or be chopped down. Ah, we shall not be chopped down in the mighty name of Jesus. If you are going through distress, that distress is signal to you that it is time to move. It is time to grow. Amen. It is time for you not to take that word of God that you have been that you have not been taking so seriously. It is time to take it more seriously. It is time to take it to another notch. It is time to take it to another level. Maybe your prayer time has been just been a certain amount of time. Maybe it's time to keep it up a notch. Amen. It means it is time to grow. Verse 6 tells us that troubles come in various forms. And lastly, 
Troubles does, should not diminish the Christian joy. Troubles should not diminish the Christian joy, which is why we must not forsake the assembly of us together. Why do I say this? I say this because joy is contagious. Even if you are not, you know, um, you know, some of us are married. We get in the scuffle in the, in the morning. We are still heading to church. Things are not all that great. But yeah, you still come. But you know, by your coming is actually a good thing. Because whomever you are standing next to, believing you are in the right company anyways, their joy can be contagious and radiate onto you. In as long as you are also still trying to push to get out of that dark space you are in, and you are trying to, you know, as you are trying, and they are also rejoicing, their joy can, can you know, it can, it can, you know, it's contagious. Amen? It's like, for example, if a person smiles at you, even if you are frowning, you will smile. Why? Because it's contagious. Verse 7 tells us why we should greatly rejoice. Why we should greatly rejoice. Verse 7 says that the genuine of your faith being much precious than gold that perishes, that it is that though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. At the revelation of of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 tells us why we should greatly rejoice. The reason you and I should greatly rejoice is so that the genuineness of our faith, being more precious than gold, when it has been tested, will be found of praise, honor, glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Trials test the reality and purity of your faith. The only way we are going to know if your faith is real, the only way we are going to know if your faith is, uh, is pure is when you, you go through something. Hmm? Yes, none of us need to. We don't like. We don't like troubles. We don't like pain. But just let me. Pain serves the purpose. Pain it, it, it strengthens you. There's a saying that there, no 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 pain no gain. The pain you face today, it is not okay. Look, am I saying that you should go and look for trouble? We are not. That's not what we are saying. We are not telling you to go and look for trouble. But you know what? As in as long as you are on this earth. Every now and then, you will face a, a various form of trial. You will face a various form of trouble. For example, now, those who are facing immigration situations are facing a form of trouble. But guess what? You know what? <laughs> I love the way uh, my father and the Lord, he, he, uh, he, he gave a testimony of a man that was looking for a job. And they gave him one you know, he told him, he prophesied to him that you, you're going you're gonna to get a job. He put on his suit. He's ready, you know, his wife was still mocking him that you don't have a job. What are you doing wearing your suit? And then guess what? He gets the call. And, and he gets the call. The, the call is for, a temporary, is for a temporary job. So he goes for the job. And then when he finished the job, he came back home. And I now called uh, my, my, my pastor. And he told him that, well, you know, the job is just temporary. And the man, to, and our pastor told him that, are you foolish? When you go back there the next day, you take off your feet, you take off your shoes, and you step on the ground there, and you and you and you prophesy and you speak to the ground that place that my feet are stepped upon this place. I take possession of it. Yes, he was facing a trouble of joblessness, and he only had a temporary one, and he's looking for a full-time job. But his job is that his response is to believe and take authority, and God gave him the job. We thank God for that, for that testimony. That being said, that does not mean that we must keep trouble on, for ourselves. Even though we can ask God for mercy, even though, you know, now there are times we will go through trouble that we ourselves have brought on ourselves. But, you know, by asking for God's mercy and us repenting, more so, the situation you can, will be dissipated. Will dissipate. But what, what, what you must understand is, for example, now, look at the story of Job. Job was not exactly looking for trouble, but guess what? He was nominated. Amen? But guess what? He, he pulled through. You know? He pulled through. His face was tested. And he pulled through. The same thing with Abraham. Abraham in, in uh, Genesis 22, 1, uh, 1 to 12. We won't read that. I'll just paraphrase. Uh, 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 God came to Abraham and said, give me Isaac. What did Abraham do? Well, he says, the Lord take it and give it. So, he gave it. <laughs> but I'm not saying that it was easy. Only God knows the sleepless nights he had before he went to go, to, to go and sacrifice the child. But guess what? He did what he had to do. He, and, and, and when he was sacrificed, what happened? God showed up and said, don't touch the son. 
don't touch Isaac. I have provided a sacrificial lamb for you. I sac- sorry, sacrificial lamb for you. So, but guess what? His faith was being tested. His faith was being tested. Our faith will be tested every now and then. But it's our job to greatly rejoice. Verse 8 tells us another reason to greatly rejoice. And this is, and this is because it proves that you believe even when there is no physical manifestation. You know, it's easy actually to believe when you see something. You know? But you know what? What about when it is not coming forth yet? Can you believe when, when it's not here? Can you believe that, you know, one day you are going to live in a three-garage house. One day you are going to have, you, 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 one day the Lord is going to reward you greatly on your job. One day God is going to do things that seem so mind-boggling that your mind cannot even contemplate. The things that seem almost impossible. Can you believe that one day God will do it for you? And when you are doing that, you are doing with great joy in your heart. You are not moping around thinking that, you know, John 20 verse 29b, just John 20, 29b says, Blessed are those who have not yet seen, yet they believe. Huh? Blessed are those who have not yet seen the manifestation, yet they believe. Verse 9 tells us, shares with us, what happens when we believe. What happens when we believe? It says, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What happens to us when we believe, when we, when we remain when, when we believe by remaining steadfast, when we, when we are steadfast, we, 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 are, we are not going to deviate. We are going to believe like Abraham in Romans 8 verse 18. Who, who says that? It says that contrary to hope. Amen. You know, there are some situations when we look at it. You might, some people will say there is no hope. Right? But yet, you know what? Abraham said contrary to hope. In hope he believed. So that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So that... Your, so, and so shall your descendants be. To put in short form, he, be, he believed and he became and he overcame. Amen? So when we believe, we become and we overcome. By believing, even when we are going through various trials and we receive the end, when we believe, when we are going through, we receive the end of our faith, which is the positive outcome for trusting in God. The end of our faith is the positive outcome of trusting in God. Salvation of our souls, in verse, in verse 9, refers to our glorification in, he, in heaven by receiving Christ. This was Peter's way of comforting the saints who were going through trials and, and despite what, uh, what they were facing, there is an inheritance, a salvation waiting for them in heaven. So whenever we are going through stuff, whenever we are being persecuted on the job, wherever we are, whatever it is that disturbs us, we must always remember there is an inheritance waiting. There is he- heavenless, heavenly inheritance waiting. We must understand that there is a glorification in heaven for the receiving of, of Christ. <coughs> Romans 8 verse 23. Romans 8 verse 23 says, Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of the body. So, you know, as we rejoice, we are, you know, we are groaning in the spirit. We are waiting. We are eagerly waiting for adoption. We are waiting for his coming back, for when we shall be received back. And I pray that as we wait, the Lord will give us the spirit of endurance in the name of Jesus. Verse 10 to 12. Verse 10 to 12. It says, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what and what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating that he testifying beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that will follow. To them it was revealed that not to them but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things which angels decide to look into. Verse 12 to 10 to 12 makes us understand that understand the greatness, the greatness of the nature of the heavenly inheritance, which interchangeably or interchange, interchangeably call, is called our complete salvation. The nature of heavenly inheritance is, is immense because divine agents such as prophets, the Holy Spirit, the apostles, and angels proclaim the message God gave them to us of that of this great salvation. And they such I inquired carefully to know more about when this grace called heavenly inheritance will come. They didn't even get to see it. 
but they were preaching it to us. They did not know when it was coming, but yet they were telling us about it. That's how immense it was. That's how great it was. And I pray, I pray that you and I will endure to the end and that we will not miss out on our heavenly inheritance soon to be revealed to us in totality in Jesus' mighty name. We want to go into certain things, certain things we must know about the heavenly inheritance. Now, we, uh, we are, so we're going to look at certain things, a few things. But we, before we do that, let me read our, um, our introduction. Understanding the heavenly inheritance is to understand the gravity and what heavenly inheritance symbolizes to us. The word inheritance is, some, is something that we encounter in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The English dictionary defines the word inheritance as a thing that is inherited. For instance, when the elderly pass away, they leave a will behind that, state, that dictates how the, property which, how the property they left behind should be distributed to their loved ones so there will be no disputes or arguments. There is, this is usually done by a lawyer who notifies those who are, who are concerned when the time comes. The Bible also backs this process up in Proverbs 13 verse 22. Proverbs 13 verse 22, it says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up. Is, but wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. The earthly inheritance we inherit from our elderly or loved one is not the same as the heavenly inheritance in our text in First Peter one. The Old Testament tells us about our inheritance that God instructed Moses to divide to the. To divide among the 12 tribes, even though Joshua was the one who was later given the opportunity, mandate to do so. The inheritance God gave them had a depth of meaning. In Numbers 36 verse 7, Numbers 36 verse 7, the Bible says that the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel shall keep the inheritance of the tribe of his father. Why is, why is it that God instructed them that they must not sell or give their inheritance to another tribe. Why, what, what was so special about the inheritance that God instructed them to keep it? The reason, the reason, according to the recovery version of the Holy Bible, is because the inheritance is symbolic. It's symbolic. It signifies Christ. And Christ is not transferable. Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 verse 11 says, Christ we have obtained our inheritance that is our that is true faith in Christ we have eternal life now Naboth if an uh, Naboth in first Kings 21 verse 3 refused to sell his vineyard to Ahab according to God's instruction to the Israelites why did Naboth not sell his his vineyard to his his his, his uh, vegetable garden to Ahab is because that this this uh, this inheritance signified Christ I must not be transferred to anybody else Naboth understood the nature and importance of his inheritance. In today's teaching, we want to look at some things that we need to know about, our, about the heavenly inheritance and how we must ensure that we are not disqualified from it and the benefits of, and, and how and the benefits of possessing it. Things we must know, a couple of things. First of one, first of all, is that you and I are heirs. You must be an heir. You must be an heir. To, be, to, to, to possess the heavenly inheritance. That is, Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. You must, if you have not yet received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are not an heir. But if you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are an heir and a believer. And, you are, and, you are, and, you, and all believers are heirs through Christ. We'll take one scripture from there. Uh, Romans 4 verse 13. Romans 4 verse 13. It says, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to, the, or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The heavenly inheritance is a covenant between us who are descendants of Abraham. If you are a child of Abraham and you believe in Christ Jesus, you are an heir. Another thing that we need to know is that our inheritance is not transferable. And we've looked at that in Numbers 36 verse 7. We've seen that in Numbers 36 verse 7. Another thing that we need to know is that we, we as believers, are an, we are an inheritance of God. We are an inheritance of God. We can see that in, in um, Deuteronomy 32 verse 9. Deuteronomy 32 verse 9, it says, it says, for the Lord, Deuteronomy 32 verse 9 says, for the Lord's portion is his people, 
is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. When the, what the scriptures are simply saying, what, what the scripture is simply saying is that Israel is God's chosen people. However, Romans 11 verse 17 also says that we who are Gentiles have been, have been grafted in among them. And we also have become partakers. So just because Israel is God's chosen people, we as Gentiles have been grafted in as well. And we are also heirs as well. The heavenly inheritance is our hope if we endure. If we endure. If you, might, if, if you have been listening to everything I've been saying, I've been echoing that word endurance so far. We must endure. We must endure. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2 verse 12. It says, If we endure, if we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we also, we, he also will deny us. What does, this, what does this mean? It means that delayed gratification and perseverance are evidences of genuineness of our faith, which sets us, which, which sets us up for heavenly inheritance. However, if we choose to do otherwise by denying him, then we do not belong to him. I pray that we will always, we will never deny him in Jesus' name. Again, also moving forward, uh, another thing we need to know that as believers and heirs, we must overcome to inherit. You must overcome to inherit. Yes, I, as believers, yes, through the genuineness of our faith, we have the heavenly inheritance. However, it, we also have to overcome. We also have to overcome. We see this in Revelation 21, verse 7. Revela Revelation 21, verse 7. It says, Revelation 21, verse 7, it says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. You need to overcome to inherit. What does this simply mean? It seems like as believers, we live victoriously over sin, and anything that can hinder our relationship with, with God. To overcome means to live victoriously. By, the, way you, the way you inherit is by overcoming, overcoming, living victoriously over sin and anything that can hinder your relationship with God. Another thing that we need to know about our heavenly inheritance is that a sanctified life is a guarantee of heavenly inheritance. A sanctified life is a guarantee of heavenly inheritance. Let's look at Acts 20, verse 32. Acts 30, verse 22. He says, so now, brethren, so now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Living a sanctified life is to be built up by the word of God. To be built up means to grow spiritually. Growing spiritually aids us in living a sanctified life that guarantees our heavenly inheritance. Another thing that we need to know about the heavenly inheritance is that heavenly inheritance belongs to partakers of the heavenly calling. It belongs to the partakers of the heavenly calling. Let's look at Hebrews 3, 1 and 14. We look at Hebrews 3, 1, and then we jump to verse 14. It says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. Verse 14. Verse 14 says, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Jesus is our salvation. We as believers are partakers of the effective summons of salvation in Christ. An effective summon is like a call, a call to a secret place to dwell in the presence of God. Our steadfastness in, in wanting to be in his presence aids our qualification for the heavenly inheritance. Moving forward, we want to know how to remain qualified. How to remain qualified for the heavenly inheritance. Number one, be pure. Be pure. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. 4, 1, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3. It says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you, amp that you abstain from sexual immorality. Now, 
it is not just sexual immorality that we are supposed to abstain from. We are supposed to abstain from jealousy. We are supposed to abstain from anything that can stain our garment. Amen? Abstain from them. When you are pure, when you are pure, when you when you when you do everything in your power to be pure, you it helps you to remain qualified for the heavenly inheritance. Another thing is that you must do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not let people sway you into another direction. You have been focusing on Christ. Do not let people do not let people focus, pollute that focus. Uh, let's look at First Corinthians six verse nine. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. It says, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. It says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. I didn't say it. The Bible said it. You do not be deceived. Know the truth and hold on to it. It's that simple. If you hold on to the truth, you will be always be qualified for the heavenly inheritance. The next thing, number three, cultivate a contract, contrite and broken heart. Cultivate a contrite and broken heart. Let's look at Psalm 51, verse 17. Psalm 51, verse 17. Psalm 51, verse 17. It says, it says, it says, this the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. This, O oh God, you will not despise. Our God does not despise a broken heart, a contrite heart, a heart that is remorse, a heart that is repentant, a heart that, that even though if, if it does something wrong, it no it it, 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 it you know it comes a heart that comes to itself and, and repents immediately and asks God for mercy is a is a, is a is a heart that qualifies for the heavenly inheritance. Examine yourself regularly. What are the other ways to remain qualified? Examine yourself regularly. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourself as to whether you are still in the, as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. Always examine yourself. Always examine yourself. Look at your life. What is it about your life that is not pleasing to God that you need to change immediately? What is has what has come into your life that can you know that can cause the spirit of God to 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 leave you or you know not remain with you? You need to look at those things. You know it might be unfriendly friends. You need to dis disassociate yourself from them so that you you're not disqualified from the heavenly inheritance. You know number five, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This is so important. This is very 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 important, especially for our new converts who have received Christ. You must one of the things you need to understand. Let's look at um, uh, uh, Philippians two verse twelve. Philippians two verse twelve. He says, "Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but not much, but but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling." What is this saying? What he's saying is that. <laughs> Once you receive Christ, it is not over. After you receive Christ, you need, to, you need to follow hard after him. You need to follow hard after Jesus Christ. You have to be in the, you, you have to do everything as much as possible to be in his presence. For example, now, if you are a member of this church, we, we give so much opportunity to help you to grow, to work out your salvation. There's Sunday service, there's fresh fire, there's uh, there's ask every every other Tuesday. There's uh, there's um, there's honey out of the rock. There's so many opportunities to aid your prayer life, to ginger you to pray. And I believe that as you access those programs, put in place, the Lord will help you in Jesus' mighty name to remain qualified for the heavenly inheritance. And lastly, be perfect in Christ. Be perfect in Christ. Matthew five verse forty eight. Matthew five verse forty eight. Matthew 5, verse 48. It says, Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You must be perfect. What does that mean? It means that you must do everything to, you must, it means be mature. What is saying? Mature. Grow up. Mature. Don't just stay at one level. Move. Increase your knowledge in, in Christ Jesus. 
be wanting to do the things that please him. Increase your, uh, well, not that you increase your faith, be, be, remain, remain steadfast in faith. Amen? It's, you know, it's, it, 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 when, we, when we say increase in faith, it's, it, it's about you being conscious of what is yours. It's about you increasing your consciousness, your awareness, amen, of, what is, of, the, of the possibilities in Christ Jesus. What are those things that can disqualify or hinder us from, from the heavenly inheritance? Real quick. What are the things that can disqualify us? Lack of salvation? Lack of salvation. If you are, if you are under my voice, uh, you have, sorry, if you're under the voice of the living God right now, I, I urge you, if somehow you come in contact with this teaching later and you have not yet given your life to Jesus Christ, I beg of you, give your life to Jesus Christ. It is, it is, of, it is of paramount, I don't know how, how the magnitude I can put on it. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Lack of salvation is, will hinder us, from, will hinder, can hinder a, a person from receiving the heavenly inheritance. John 3, John 3, Verse 3, and we jump to 5. John 3, verse 3, and we jump to 5. It says, Jesus answered and sent to him. And this is Nicodemus he is talking to here. He says, he says, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Do not let people joke. Don't let people, don't, don't be, do not be deceived. Do not say just because uh, uh, as long as I'm good and I do good things and I don't hurt anyone, I will make, no. <laughs> that is not a qualification. Those things, you will reap the benefits of those things on the earth. But your qualification for entering the kingdom of God is that you must be born again. You must not lack salvation. Another thing that can hinder our uh, that hinder us from from heavenly inter- uh, in- in- inheritance is sin. Please run away from sin. Let's r- look at uh, Romans uh, Romans six twelve to fourteen. Romans six twelve to fourteen. This is a, this is a, this is a, a scripture on consecration. Romans six verse uh, ve- Romans six twelve. To, it says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its laws. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are, un- you are not under law, but under grace. There are many people who abuse this thing, this thing called grace. <laughs> and you must be very careful. You need to be very careful. You need to be very careful. Hmm? We abuse this thing called grace. You know, the Bible is, in, you know, uh, uh, Paul the Apostle was saying in Romans, he says, what shall we say again? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You cannot continue in sin. I say that grace will, grace will save me, grace will save me. You need to change if you want to remain qualified, if you don't want to be disqualified for the heavenly inheritance. If you are still walking in sin, you need to change. You need to go to, run to God right now. You see, the first scripture we have read right now, it tells us that we must not present our members as instruments, as instruments of unrighteousness, which means that the, your, the, 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 the entrances into your heart, which is your eyes, your ears, protect them from, any th- from sin. Protect them from sin. Protect them from sin. Another thing is that, another thing that can hinder us is insens- insensitivity. Insensitivity to the Holy Spirit and careless living. Insensitivity to the Holy Spirit and careless living. If let's look at uh, First Peter five verse eight. First Peter five verse eight. First Peter five verse eight. It says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. If you are not sober, if you are not vigilant." Your enemy will be disqualified for the heavenly inheritance. What does this? What does sober and vigilance mean? How do I put this? It's very simple. You know, you know that. Okay, for example, now, while would instead of building, instead of building a door that 
temptation can use you to walk through to the lion. It is better for you to build a wall. Amen? When you build a wall, that means there is no way you are, you are going to enter into that situation. The wall is you being sober. The wall is you being vigilant. Amen? I pray that we will, be, we, shall, we will continue to be sober and vigilant and that we shall not be insensitive to the Holy Spirit when he is warning us of danger that is pending. Another one is lukewarmness. Lukewarmness and backsliding. Lukewarmness and backsliding. Let's look at uh, Romans 3, sorry, Revelation 3, 15 to 16. As we bring this teaching to a close, let's look at Romans, sorry, Revelation 3, 15 to 16. Revelation 3, 15 to 16. It says, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Verse 16. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold or hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. This is, uh, this is, this is uh, um, John speaking here to the church of Laodicea. And they were, they were being lukewarm. What does lukewarm mean? Lukewarm means when a person begins to backslide. You know? when, there is no, when there is no constant position in Christianity. And you, you are not either growing and you are backsliding. That will disqualify a person for the heavenly inheritance. Another one that we should look at is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Let's open our Bibles to Mark 11, verse 25. Mark 11, verse 25. It says, Mark 11, verse 25. It says, and, wh and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against someone, forgive him, that your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. You cannot expect Jesus, you cannot expect God to forgive you if you are still holding people in your heart. Let people go. Let people go. Forgive people. No, they will, it, it, one of the things that we need to know as Christians is that offenses will come. We will always offend each other. Don't, it, it's, or it's in the Bible. You will offend each other. Offenses will come. But when they come, let them come and let them quickly. Let it go. Let it be like what? Let it wash quickly. Why? Because if you let offenses remain, guess what? You are also hindering the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. So let quickly forgive and not just forgive, forget. Another one is, and lastly, let's look at blasphemy. Blasphemy and grieving the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy and grieving the Holy Spirit. Let's look at Matthew 12, 31 and 32. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. Matthew 12, 31 to 32. It says, therefore, I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not, will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will, be for, it will be forgiving him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiving him either in, in this age or the age to come. That scripture is so explanatory. Don't speak blasphemy against the Holy Spirit if you don't want to be disqualified for the heavenly inher inheritance. We thank God for his word today. And I pray that as you uh, absorb all that we have talked about, all we have spoken today, all that has been spoken, that I pray that it will help us in our growth, in our growth, in our spiritual work, in our spiritual journey on this earth. As you and I know, we are pilgrims here. This is a journey. It's a journey. And at some point, we are going to leave this place. And it's important that as we, we, we know how to live our life here so that we do not miss out on our heavenly inheritance. And as we live our lives to please him who, called, who has called us, we, I pray that you will not miss heaven in Jesus' mighty name. As before we pray, let us uh, bring our, 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 our tithes and offering, our tithe and offering um, on the screen, if possibly. If you are giving electronically, if you are giving electronically, please go to our website. On, I believe on the right hand side, follow the prompt on our website, uh, www.christsupreme.ca, www.christsupreme.ca on the right hand side. Click on donate and follow the prompt and that you you'll be able to donate you give your titan offering and also if you are giving by e-transfer uh, that is uh, uh the, the the email address is christ supreme christ supreme at dot christ supreme dot ca christ supreme dot ca and as you do that the lord will bless you richly in jesus mighty name let us pray father we just bless you and the lord we exalt you father we give you praise thank you for your goodness thank you for your mercy 
Thank you for giving us all things that come to life and godliness. Thank you for your word that has come our way today. Lord, we pray, Lord, that as we receive your word, that your word has fallen on, on, on fertile ground and that your word is bringing forth fruit. We pray, Lord, that in everything that we do, O oh God, that our, our, we will always, we will, we, will ha- we will possess, we will fight and possess for the spirit of endurance. And that at the end of it all, Lord, we will not miss out our heavenly inheritance. We thank you, Lord, Father God, for this word. We give you glory. We pray, Lord, that this word is profiting us in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord, for listening and answering our prayer. We give you all the praise. We exalt you. We magnify you. We are forever grateful, Lord, for this opportunity, for this privilege, O Lord, to receive, O God. Thank you, King of Kings. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let us share the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we shall dwell in the presence of the Lord now and forevermore. Amen. Let somebody shout hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this message. We invite you to visit us at www.christsupreme.ca for more spirit-filled messages and for more information about the church. You can also call us at 647-884-884. 8494. God bless you.